Wow, hello, hello. Um, it's it's wonderful to see you all. Um, Cassandra Eng, um, really, really pleased to see you. Um, Cassandra is a researcher at um, uh, Stanford University. And, um, uh, you know, look forward to diving into more detail of what she is doing. We've known each other for a while. I know uh, a little bit about her, her research. And um, I would like to give a special shout out for, um, <laughs> to Professor Eleni Mangina um, for uh, making the effort to be here, given the time it is for her where she is in the world. So um, we somehow missed that. We were trying to be very conscious of, of um, the time zones, but somehow we let that slip by. So um, very, very grateful to you for, for being here and look forward to hearing about um, more of the work you do, your, your research and your work with the IEEE on the um, ethics uh, committee there. And uh, Dr. Nigel Newbutt, um, uh, who is um, uh, a professor um, at uh, University of Florida in advanced learning technologies and runs the Equitable Learning Technology Lab there, which uh, centers autistic groups in solving real world problems with advanced technologies. So um, I want to um, kind of give you all each a chance to um, say a little bit more about your work, about what you do. And uh, as I said, I'm going to start with uh, Cassandra Ng, sports neuroscience fellow at Stanford University, who earned her PhD in learning sciences and cognitive neuroscience from Carnegie Mellon University. So Cassie, would you mind please giving our audience an overview of your research on optimizing learning outcomes in immersive contexts that include physical activity? Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, Karen. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, uh, are you able to do that? Um, is it showing up for you? Uh, let's see, now that's Julie's. I don't see yours coming up. Um, did you use the, uh, try the new button, the plus sign? Let's see if that will work for you. Oops, uh-oh, we lost her all together there. Um, I hope she'll be back in a moment with um, with something to show us. Okay, in that case, so that we, uh, because we don't have, we don't have a lot of time. Oh, Cassie is back, okay. All right, <laughs> sorry about that, <laughs> yes. Um, uh I tried sharing my screen and it kicked me out. So oh, no. I'm so sorry. Do you do you want to share something with me? If you can put a link in the private chat and maybe I can maybe I can try to share it for you. Um, there, you go. there it is. Okay, it's there. Okay. Do you see these? Do you see these slides? Uh, yes. Is it? You might need to just put that? it in presenter, presenter um, mode. But yes, we do do see them there. Yes. Okay, perfect. So hello, everyone. As Karen says, I am a sports neuroscientist at Stanford. And um, really briefly, my research focuses on improving cognitive and physical um, wellness outcomes using technology enhanced interventions. Um, so I'm going to go through this super quickly. But um, basically, a lot of you have probably heard of brain training games, uh, but what's been found through research is that they don't really work, meaning there's no generalizability to real world context. Um, but interestingly, in the kinesiology and, and aging neuroscience literature, they're finding that combined training through exer games, these physically active video games, improve cognitive functioning. Um, but a lot of stud but understanding why these extra games are actually working, um, that is the research that I do. So um, to do this, I took a traditional cognitive task and I turned it into an immersive environment. So with three to five year old children, I actually had them um, through a projected immersive environment actually um, participating in a cognitive game, but they're using their whole bodies as opposed to traditional cognitive training where they're either using an iPad or being sedentary. 
Um, yeah, Cassie, can I can I interrupt you? I'm so sorry, but um, we're we're seeing we're not seeing like the the slide and it's large. As, can you put it in presentation mode or or um, slide share mode? What I'm, I'm sure it is. Um, oh, sorry, do you see it like really? Do you see it really small? I see the, the I see the ones on the side and then the, and then you know one side in the middle. It's not in uh, presentation mode. Um, oh, that's really strange. Let's try again. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And if you want to, if you, you know, again, if you want to drop a link to me, I can try to. Okay. So if, <laughs> what is happening? Okay. So when I do, so this is, is it not like screen? It wasn't, it wasn't full screen. No. Still, it's still not full screen. Uh, no, I don't see it at all. No, 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 there it is. No. I, and it's not. Yeah. Um, we're still seeing. Yes. Uh, but maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the best we can do for now. Um, is it like not readable? Is it not readable? <laughs> it's really difficult to see because it's, you know, the real estate is so small on the screen, unfortunately. This is so strange. So I'm wondering if this will, okay, I can do that. I can mac maximize it. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, should, should I just keep, should I, I can just keep going. I'll just keep going. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Let's keep going. Okay. Well, I'm very sorry for the small visuals, but I will do my best to verbally explain them. So I basically, um, to understand the actual effectiveness of these extra games, I had an extra game condition, um, a, co a cognitive condition where it's the same exact game, but children are sitting. So increasing the cognitive demands, but decreasing the amount of exercise, um, an exercise condition. So it's the exact same game, but there's less cognitive demands. So less distractors um, that I built within the game. And then a no play control group. So this is really important for developmental research, just to control for practice and maturation effects. Um, and then before and after children were given um, standard neurocognitive assessments and also um, neural imaging, so actually imaging their brains. And what was found um, behaviorally is that children improved performance on these neurocognitive tests and teachers also rated their behavior better in the classroom, but only in this combined exercise cognitive training group. And what was found with the neural imaging data is that across, like within the prefrontal cortex, which we know is a hub for cognition. Um, we found increased connectivity, but only again for this combined cognitive exercise training group compared to all of the other control groups. Uh, so what I've been doing now is understanding, uh, you know, not only kind of, so th there was a proof of concept here that this combined exercise cognitive training improves children's, not only their performance on neurocognitive assessments, but also teachers rated their behavior better, like in a real world classroom context. And we also saw changes in the brain. So what I'm doing now is I'm seeing if this generalizes to another virtual context. So taking a commercially available game and I'm working with a clinical population. So an ADHD population or children who might need it the most. And again, I have these very carefully controlled like an exercise condition. So if any of you have played Beat Saber, you're probably very familiar with this. Um, an extra game condition. So the cognitive demands are increasing because they have to follow the rules of directionality while also um, navigating this virtual space and also using their whole bodies. A sedentary condition, exact same game, but sitting, and then a control group where there's less cognitive demands and they're also sitting. Um, and in terms of what I've, the novelty about um, where we are in terms of technology though, isn't that we just have wire, these wireless portable light VR headsets that people can actually exercise in, but we also for, um, you know, if someone told me, 10 years ago that we'd have portable neuroimaging, I wouldn't believe it. 
but I've actually been pilot testing this. So um, these are wireless um, portable neuroimaging. And so I actually have a scan of my brain while riding a bike and it is reliable and valid. So the future here is to combine them with these wireless VR headsets so we can see um, and monitor brain activity in real time during these VR interventions. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's that's super exciting. And I think one of the things that, um, and this this came up in one of the panels earlier was the, um, the idea that uh, VR engages our body. And so that, that allows these sorts of effects that you are researching. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Eleni Mangini, Mangina is the vice president international for science at University College Dublin and a senior member at IEEE who's played an important role in the IEEE global initiative on XR ethics. And she also has a background and interest in intelligent systems and artificial intelligence. Um, Eleni, your work is extensive. You more than 100 publications on a number of topics, including recent publications on augmented reality for education and immersive tech in healthcare education. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your research in XR and education and your work for the IEEE Global Initiative on XR Ethics. Sure, Karen, and thank you very much for the invitation. I just want to follow up on the uh, Casey's Cassandra's work there, and I had a personal interest on the ADHD students and the impact of XR. So this is how it started back around 2015, my interest in XR impact assessment for students with ADHD, but I didn't do neuroimaging Cassandra. Instead of that, I wanted to focus on uh, the standardized tests because, because of GDPR issues in Europe, I, I wasn't able to do that especially for students in primary school. So instead of that, we did the intervention with augmented reality. I had a pilot study back then in 2017 up to 2019. I had 117 diagnosed with ADHD students in primary school all around Ireland. And we had three groups. We had the control group, we had a web-based intervention, and we had the augmented reality intervention. Once we finished with the intervention and we analyzed the data, uh, because we did pre and post tests on English literacy skills, we did use the NARA test and the Vernon test, we wanted to see their spelling ability, their reading ability. So for example, students diagnosed with ADHD, and we had a number of comorbidity issues as well, so they would have ASD, some of them, or dyslexia. But uh, we found that after the intervention, the reading aids increased. I still receive emails from parents saying that their whole life changed. So it, it, a minor, minor intervention, which lasted only around um, from between 10 and eight, 18 weeks, depending on how fast they went from level to level, to so different level. There were seven levels of uh, the literacy program. We had a company working with us, the Words Worth Learning program with literacy skills that we transformed with augmented reality and uh, a little bit of intervention, 15 minutes a day, and uh, it just made a huge, huge difference. And the next step, and that's what I want to talk to you about, Cassandra, next week, hopefully when we meet, is the neuroimaging. I'm really interested to see what is happening really uh, neurologically, because the moment we understand with XR uh, what is the impact, the positive impact that I found from my data, then we will understand more the special abilities that these students have, because they do. So this is how it started back in 2017 with this project. And uh, then I applied for further projects, and one of them was the Horizon 2020. It's called Arete, Augmented Reality Educational Systems. And I have now under intervention around 4,500 students around Europe. We have four pilots. Actually, we started with three pilots. Uh, the first one, the English literacy skills, again, for English-speaking students in Europe. The second one is STEM science, and we focused on geometry and geography. And the third one, which is quite unique, innovative, and we haven't seen it a lot, Although, Cassandra, you did touch a little bit on the behavioral analysis uh, of the students. 
So we are applying augmented reality to the PBIS process, which is the positive behavior in schools program, the three tier level approach that we have. I have uh, uh, Professor Sue Ling from Amsterdam, who is an expert and has been to the States many years in applying the PBIS as well. And uh, we're applying this for pilot three. So with pilot three, we have around 550 to 700 students and then pilot two we have 3500 and around 100 for pilot one now the interesting part was through another project another european project i'm working on because i wanted to see the technology readiness uh, assessment of the stakeholders so we did a questionnaire and we had more than 350 educators from europe and we found out that although Generation Z is more than ready for, for advanced education with XR, the teachers are not. So I've used the European project, the H2020, to create a new pilot. So now we have invited, and you might have seen it on LinkedIn, we have now invited teachers to come and be trained on how to use XR in education. So there is a little bit of history behind all these projects, but it is exciting. And within the project, because of GDPR, uh, we had to do the ethics self-assessment, be approved, have an ethics advisory board. And then I started working with an absolutely amazing team uh, at IEEE Standards Association. And it is the global initiative for XR ethics. And it is part of the ethically aligned design first edition that uh, we had the standards and I created, uh, I, I was the executive editor for the eight papers that we have published, but the one that I wrote and I, I led the whole chapter was the one on XR ethics and education. And um, if, you, if you have a look at the file, you will see that there are 42 recommendations. This is uh, coming through the experience of the last uh, we're two, 22, for the last 10 years in the area. And uh, if you have a look at the, at the content, the specific content, you will see that it covers the requirements for privacy. Uh, the, we analyze a little bit on the regional ethics in terms of how the ethics are in the States, in Europe, and East Asia. Then the privacy and education requirements, the user requirements, hardware and software. And then in terms of 3D content, the accessibility, the teaching and learning, the authoring toolkits. So within the Horizon 2020, we have created an open source authoring toolkit for the educators. And we're actually launching next month our own marketplace, which is open source again, uh, because it is European funding. And... Um, at the end, we have 42 recommendations within this paper. And uh, we planned, actually I plan to create a working group on this and, and further develop the standards. Uh, I want to focus on the ethical metadata in XR content. And, and I hope uh, this will take off quite soon. Wow, that's amazing. Such an important initiative. Um, thank you so much for sharing this and really look forward to, to watching what, what happens there. And um, everyone should, should um, uh, uh, take a look at these 42 recommendations and uh, seek out this, this um, uh, work that has been done by the IEEE uh, Global Ethics uh, Committee. Um, Nigel, uh, your lab is called the Equitable Learning Technology Lab at the University of Florida, and um, I, I know that you center autistic groups in solving real-world problems with advanced technologies, and I'm curious about the real-world problems and uh, how, how you use advanced technology in it. Tell us, tell us more about all this. Sure. Well, thank you for uh, having us here, and I'm really fascinated in this sort of ethical conversations that have been taking place is that something else we've been exploring in terms of ethical applications of VR tools for some of these groups but essentially the you know the lab that I run and the work that I do really believes that or centers its work around inquiry for equitable learning technologies being informed through collaboration community-based engagement and cross-disciplinary working but while and as you mentioned really placing autistic people central to that endeavor and involving them in the conversation about 
how these technologies can feed into their into their lives, how it can benefit their educational outcomes, their ambitions for living independent lives and so on. So really, we're being guided by that community. And part of the job in the lab is to kind of draw, create spaces where we can have those conversations, where we can understand the challenges they're facing and then identify how these technologies can potentially inform and help overcome some of those challenges. So for example, some of the work we've been doing is around um, STEM education in schools, where we see autistic people having massive strengths in, in STEM-based areas, um, but being incredibly left behind because the pedagogy isn't quite available, isn't, isn't really there in, in terms of enabling them to achieve in the same way that their neurotypical peers can. So we're looking at ways VR and other technologies can play a role in kind of supporting that inclusion, um, but also looking at how we can use VR to manage anxiety uh, with autistic groups, um, social anxiety, as well as anxiety of potentially really, well, I guess to some people quite simple things, but we created a VR app where um, autistic people were group that we worked with, young autistic people we worked with, were really worried about visiting a museum. So by creating a virtual reality tour of that museum, we were able to manage some of their anxiety uh, challenges and issues. Um, so we're so like I say, what might seem quite a simple solution was, a, was something that really meant that some of those individuals because that could access a cultural resource that they felt very worried about accessing in the real world. So that's kind of like a short boilerplate kind of overview of what we're doing. But what I would really like to sort of emphasize is that we're really placing them central to this and also not just involving them in identifying the challenges and how we can solve that, but actually involving them as co-designers, co-researchers in the research that we do. And so therefore, a lot of the research I'm doing, and it's, this started back in 2015, when we first started working with autistic groups and wanting to understand their experiences of these technologies. So people with sensory, sensory problems and sensory concerns, it might not be very wise and sensible to suddenly put a headset on them and ask them to work in some of these spaces. So we developed some of the first research actually in 2015, treading very carefully, very ethically around how they experience some of these wearable technologies, these new wearable, highly immersive technologies, and whether or not there was any ethical concerns, health and safety concerns about that. And we've continued to work in that way. And we currently have published guidance around how to use some of these technologies in schools as well. So all the work I do is outside of the research lab and in schools or in centres or in homes where people actually get their hands and, uh, on and use these technologies. So wanting to understand what some of the barriers are around that, some of the barriers around technologies in schools. As we all know, there's a lot of challenges around that. And likewise, the challenges around um, actually deploying these technologies in real life settings. What are some of the health and safety and ethical concerns that may arise uh, around that? So that's a short um, overview of some of the work that we're interested in doing within the research lab. Wow, um, really exciting what all what all of you are doing. And there's so so many questions that I want to follow up with you. And as is has been the case all day long, we find that these sessions are just too short to to dive as deeply into them as we would as we would like. Um, I, I think I will ask um, where where because you you know you all as you're doing your own research, you are also surveying the other research out there, and um, you know I'd like to hear from you about what you think is some of the most uh, significant work or uh, exciting or interesting trends in the research and also maybe where the gaps are in the research on XR for education. Yeah, if that, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off, I guess. Um, I think where some of the exciting opportunities are, we've already heard from the, from, from the first presenter talking about the, some of the interesting uh, developments in that space. I mean, for me, I think artificial intelligence is a really big kind of buzzy area that's connecting quite closely and quite well in meaningful ways with, 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 with XR technologies. The ability to kind of build in learner analytics and tailor bespoke, you know, VR experiences using AR. I think AI is a really exciting development that's happening. And, you know, UF, for example, have you know, invested you know, with NVIDIA in that particular area and there's a big drive around AI. But I also think there's a huge gap and a huge, it's not a huge gap, it's because this work has accelerated so quickly but there's still a huge need to make sure that we place, place users and users' experiences central. So I think UX and UI around some of this, some of this work is really important that we keep continuing to research that. And Meta, as we know, has invested quite heavily in this technology, and they currently do a lot of research with UX and UI. But I think for me, that's something that we could continue to support in really meaningful ways moving forward. 
Great. Thank you. Cassie, do you want to respond to that? Yeah. yeah so um, going off of what Nigel says, I think that um, exactly what he said about the capabilities we have with machine learning. So one of the common questions that I get um, among, from parents, from educators, from uh, anyone really is, why do we need the technology enhancements to something as simple as exercise? And um, you know, something I say is that like not everyone might have access to safe recreational equipment. They might not be able to afford um, a gym membership. They might not feel safe in that running, going out and for a run in the neighborhoods that they live in. Um, but something advantageous about um, these type of immersive technologies is that they can adapt to individual performance with these type of machine learning that we have. So something that's really important um, that I noticed from even designing the games, and it's there's a lot of literature that supports this, is that um, is just adaptability. So you know, like when there is one teacher and 35 children, it's really hard for that educator to you know go and adapt to every single child's capabilities. But when um, you have a technology that can do that. Um, you know, if, if you can tell that a student is struggling based on the algorithms that it has, so it'll tailor it to that individual's capabilities. Um, I think that is, you know, like, that is why what makes XR so, um, you know, like it's, yeah, it's like really like the future. <laughs> um, and in terms of what's missing, I think that, um, you know, more research on, you know, the t amount of dosage and duration okay. uh, is, and for for these individual um, students, that is going to be like individual differences in general is always something that we need more research on. But um, you know, the these algorithms need to train on some sort of data. So mm -hmm. I think the more um, piloting of these technologies will help with that. Yeah, yeah, really, really interesting. And when you were talking about the uh, adaptability with of, of AI and using that, um, I would, I, I think I introduced the two of you, but I would love for you and Rolando Macis to have a conversation. I think you all would have some really interesting things to talk about. Um, uh, Professor Mangina, um, what, what would you say are some of the most exciting trends and uh, and some of the gaps in the research? Yeah, and I totally agree with uh, the comments Nigel had and Cassie. And I just want to add a, a couple of research gaps that I have realized the last 10 years. But first of all, I start with the positive. And because we have 5G, the, the blending of physical and digital worlds is just shaping the whole future. So imagine if I had the augmented annotation straight away through my glasses in the real environment, uh, living in the physical world, then I could get notifications much faster than my phone and then react quickly. So we have, we, we have the 5G networks, and so they, it provides the high speed, lower latency, delivering photorealistic location-based XR experiences. So it's absolutely amazing. The future looks bright, but at the same time, there is some, some research gaps. Uh, and some gaps in terms of the expertise. We don't have many experts in the development of the XR 3D content, right? The, the quality that is needed uh, in order to have something vivid, realistic, some dynamic experience uh, so that uh, it, it, it can actually activate the interest and the motivation. Another area that um, would be interesting for the future is the real-time collaboration and uh, designing while we're designing the XR worlds and as you mentioned, the UX design. It's a huge area for development. And um, advanced XR tools. But apart from that, if we talk about just education, we are missing the open educational resources in XR. Uh, and something that I think all the educators are waiting for in order to advance the technology acceptance model worldwide. And th this is something that I think will speed up from now on. 
and we're going to test with the marketplace and see how this will go. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, the, the um, open educational resources uh, did come up uh, before too. And this is all part of the accessibility, making sure that ev everyone has access to this, uh, and not, not just students, but, but teachers as well. Um, oh my goodness. Um, I can't believe that that was a, a half hour. It went by so incredibly quickly. And there is Sophia Mashasha and my friend Julie Smithson. And um, I would like to thank you so very much, um, uh, Cassie, Dr. Eng, uh, Nigel, uh, Laney, thank you very much for uh, coming and sharing your time with us today. I hope we can do this again and, and uh, spend more time and dive in a little more deeply. Um, I really appreciate you being here.